Good morning, everyone. Uh, the second day of the workshop. So far, the presentation this morning includes three, three contributions, two contributions from the Canary College, and then one contribution uh, from uh, another college, uh, another UK university, uh, on a topic related again on uh, the mystery arts bridges. So, I leave the floor to Professor Colin Smith. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me all right? Yep. yep. Okay, so I'm going to kick off this morning by telling you a bit about the medium scale physical modeling test that we've been doing. So it'll be a joint presentation by myself and Serena, who did most of the experimental work. Uh, so I'm going to cover uh, an introduction, background to why we're doing this modeling, and then a little bit about the actual methodology that we adopted. And then I'll hand over to Serena, who'll tell you about some of the uh, test work that we've been doing. So, introduction. Um, as I think it's been well covered yesterday, masonry arch bridges are complex. They display brittle and ductile behavior, deterioration due to cyclic loading. And what we found, the work that I've been doing, and Matthew and others, that physical modeling is a very valuable tool um, that we've been using the past few decades to help us understand arch response, and it very much complements uh, numerical modeling. Um, so a little sort of history of some of the physical modeling work that's been done um, in the past. So a number of full-scale tests. So there's work that Matthew did at Bolton, um, which helped uh, establish the contributions of spandrels and also the effect of ring separation. Um, we did some large-scale plane strain tests at the University of Salford, a joint salford Sheffield project. Um, and that, among other things, helped us establish some of the cyclic loading aspects that led to the PLS concept. Uh, we were able to subject these arches to uh, many numbers of uh, cycles of load. And this was very much designed to be a plane strain uh, rig because we didn't feel we fully understood two-dimensional behavior at the time. Um, but we've also been doing quite a lot of small scale tests. So it doesn't really show it on this image, but this is a flooded arch bridge. It would be quite hard to do on something this scale. And that helped establish and demonstrate that Archimedes principle does in fact um, occur and you lose quite a lot of arch capacity if your bridge is flooded. And then the other thing we can do um, is build different types of models where we can kind of unpick the mechanisms that contribute to arch capacity. So arch capacity is partly load spreading through the fill, partly the, the strength of the arch itself, partly passive resistance of the soil, partly just dead weight of material. And trying to make sure we, we got those individual components bracketed out is valuable. And so work at a smaller scale there where we can explore all those options quite quickly uh, helps us to confirm our understanding in those sort of areas. Um, but there are a number of research gaps. We've mainly focused on two-dimensional testing here. Uh, and what we wanted to do in this project was look at um, three-dimensional tests with paths rather than line loading. Um, we also wanted to explore further some of the individual components that contribute to arches, such as backing and internal spandrel, and uh, also look at how skew arches behave. They're fascinating structures, but um, quite tricky to get your head around what they actually do in response to load. So we're looking at these in, with using medium scale modeling. And just, just to sort of show where that fits into our jigsaw of the Omabi project, so we're up here uh, on the top left. And so that kind of feeds into the rapid 3D modeling analysis, helps to sort of calibrate that going down, but also across the detailed modeling side of things. OK, so our methodology. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of the models that we're working at, um, we're looking at single span and two span arches. Uh, single span are 750 mil wide in our modeling rig. Nominally, that's supposed to represent a one in four scale of one of our previous three meter full scale arches. And on the two, two uh, span arch, we got spans of 500 millimeters. Um, obviously, at scale models, you've got to scale things down. Um, we uh, decided to adopt 
for a number of our models, CNC cut sandstone, try and get as close to masonry as we could, or voussoirs and abutment blocks and so on. Um, for our 3D models, particularly the skew arches, we moved to casting blocks out of ultra-fine concrete. Skew arch elements in particular, quite complicated. And for the joints, the aim wasn't to accurately model, for example, a um, lime mortar, but uh, we needed a joint material which would allow us to build uh, models quite quickly and then dismantle them, rebuild them. If you use cement, you tend, it tends to cause a lot of problems in uh, cleaning the blocks, making them reusable. And it helps uh, even out minor variations of block size, even if we're CNC cut, there's still tolerances on that. And uh, we can reproduce the strength characteristics which we can feed into models. Um, that's a, a shot of the rig. I think Matthew showed that yesterday. So that's the kind of scale that we're working on. Um, build the arch in here. We have pluviation for, for putting in backfill and so on. Uh, the loading, uh, we use um, electric actuator. Uh, one of the things we found with that actually in, in initial test is that the friction between the actuator and the loading block is quite important effect. Uh, the actuator doesn't provide a dead weight. It provides a, a load that just goes vertically. And if you get any horizontal components of load, that can affect the load capacity by up to 20%. So we found, yeah, just putting a thrust bearing in there uh, did the trick. And then we've got a centering that we can lower and raise quite easily under here to build the arch on and deploy LVDTs and so on. Um, in terms of measurements, we're using LVDTs, obviously, load, load cells and such like. Uh, for our plane strain models, we're using um, PIV, where we can monitor displacement of backfill and arches. And then for uh, 3D arches, particularly the bare arches that we've been looking at initially, we're using DIC, where we can establish uh, three-dimensional movements in, in that arch. Uh, so a bit about soil backfill. I uh, had a number of conversations yesterday about soil backfill. It's obviously very complicated stuff that goes into bridges. Often it's quite random and varied. We just wanted a repeatable material that we could model and help us understand what was going on. So we're using uh, a sand. It's automatically deposited by pluviation in layers. We can achieve a very consistent density and a very consistent strength. And uh, the, the pluviation puts in pretty flat layers, but the very final flat layer, we vacuum flat to get it perfect for the modeling. And we just use a little plotted tube attached to a vacuum that, that, that helps circulate that. But it's quite a, there's a lot of sand to shift around. So it, it's quite an involved system with vacuums and drums and so on. Um, in terms of loading, we adopted various loading sequences, but uh, Quite a lot of the loading that we did, we like to use um, the load unload sequences. Uh, so it helps us understand what's going. If we just did a single load, the kind of failure would get the curve on the outside of this. Um, got to, I think that works. Uh, the sort of top level curve. Um, but by doing load reload, it gives us a bit more insight. So here, initially, we're getting some bedding in of our model permanent plastic deformation. But wait, when we unload and reload, we're, we're pretty much going straight down and straight up. So it's a rigid response. And that's kind of uh, implicit of a, uh, what we um, view as a kind of pre-PLS or permissible limit state, state where we're not really distort deforming the arch. The arch is not moving as we load and unload, and therefore it's unlikely to, to accumulate uh, damage due to joints opening and closing and so on. But when we get up a bit further and we do our loops, we've got very big uh, loops of displacement. And that means the arch is opening and closing as we uh, load and unload. And so that's going to be above a PLS condi condition and um, likely to fall to pieces after uh, a number of cycles. OK, I think that's my introduction done. So I'm going to pass over to Serena, who, as I said, did most of the experimental work, and she'll tell you a bit about uh, or what you've been doing there. OK, thanks, Serena. Yeah. Thanks, Colin, and good morning, everyone. 
So yeah, I'll be presenting some results from our test campaign. Um, so we started studying the effect of measuring fill. Measuring fill can manifest as packing, or it could be internal spandrel walls, or they can both be present, like for example in this bridge here. So this is the longitudinal and cross section of a um, railway bridge. And yeah, backing and internal spandrels were both present. So what we found is that these infill material have been little investigated. So we um, carried out this extensive um, experimental campaign, including 25 models and 97 load tests. So the idea here was to, uh, as Colin anticipated, investigate the effect of each single component on the arch load carrying capacity. So we had a first set of, of tests which included single span bridges and a number of bridges had backing only. And if you look at the bottom, sorry, <laughs> bottom uh, drawing, you'll see the backing extended uh, across the full width of the bridge. Then we had a number of bridges with internal spandrel walls only, uh, which only occupied around 37% of the width. And finally, we have bridges with sun, sun backfill for comparison. Um, just one thing, um, these bridges were quite narrow because uh, we were trying to model one section of the arch, so to represent um, approximately plain strain conditions so that we would, we would get to the um, failure mechanism. Then we had a second series of tests. These included two span bridges. Again, here we had models with the internal span rules only, and also models with the um, uh, soil for comparison. So this slide is presenting results from the single span bridges with the span rules. Um, so in terms of mechanism, we uh, observed this hinged mechanism. Um, and also, if you look at the spandrels, basically it's split in, th in three main sections. And uh, the bottom pictures are just showing some of the uh, cracks in the joints, just under the load and in the section of the wall far from the load. Um, in terms of capacity, if we look at this low displacement response here, we have the dotted line, which is just the response of the arch, just the bare arch, no spandrels. However, if we do add the spandrels, we have an increase in capacity by um, more than five times. So it's more than five, uh, sorry, four times higher. Um, also here, we've included a number of models where we had um, these uh, red block uh, this vertical block, which was um, essentially directing the load to the arch, onto the arch. So what we're trying to do is to remove uh, the load distribution. And also we were trying to emulate the presence of cracks in the measuring blocks, which could be due, you know, to previous loading, for example. So how does this affect the load capacity? What we found is that the capacity with, the, with this uh, pre-cracked spandrel wall was actually reduced by half. Um, so I'm referring to the orange and green lines. Um, something else we've observed is that uh, the cracking pattern or yeah, the failure mode of the spandrel walls um, in the section far from the load actually had a, um, an effect on the load capacity and also on the stiffness of the arch. So, uh, we've observed differences between tests of 10 to 20%. Uh, here we're presenting results of bridges with backing. Um, in this case, uh, we've seen the backing provided an increase in capacity by 77%. Um, also, similarly to the bridges with the spandrels, also here, uh, we've noticed that the failure load was quite sensitive to the crack pattern in the in the backing. And again, we had a difference in load. So for example, here I'm showing the load displacement response of a bridge, of two bridges actually, loaded a quarter span. Then we loaded the same two bridges at three quarter span. And as you can see, the capacity increased by around 10%. Um, and that's something that we've actually observed also with the numerical models. So if you look at the two pictures on the right hand side, the two, the two models, sorry, uh, we try to replicate 
roughly the same um, barrier mechanism. And also in that case, we had this 10% um, difference in low capacity. Okay, finally, we had bridges with some backfill. Um, so if we compare the uh, top figure with the bottom one, so the bridges with the soil, the bridges with these bundles, we've observed that they failed in very similar hinge mechanism. Also, they provided very similar uh, load carrying capacity. Um, so the bridges with the uh, soil, yeah, with sand, uh, increased the capacity by four and a half times over a bare arch. Um, if we look at this bar chart, the blue one, we can compare uh, the contribution to low carrying capacity of each single component. Um, so you can see spandrels and sand backfill were quite similar. Actually, sand backfill was slightly higher. However, if we look at the red chart, we can see that uh, the, the, the spandrel walls actually provided a higher strength if we consider the failure load per unit width. Uh, and it was more than half compared to that of the sand. And similar observation here with the two span bridge. So again, if we compare the models with the spandrels, um, we had a, uh, an increase in capacity by three and a half times. If we compare, uh, if we look at the models with the sand, the capacity was four um, and a half times higher than a bare arch. Uh, but however, if we consider the failure load per unit width, then again, the spandrels provided um, an increase in uh, capacity, uh, and it was doubled that of the sand backfield. Okay, so moving on to the 3D square arch behavior. So we are presenting some initial results because this, uh, this is obviously an ongoing work. Um, so we started with this bare arch. Geometry is very similar to the previous one, same span, same rise. However, here the bridge is uh, wider. So we had a width of 750 millimeters. And we started loading this arch a quarter span and we loaded in five different points. So at each edge of the arch, and then we loaded at one quarter of the width and then in the middle. So this is the first load case. So when we were loading on the edge, um, so what we can see in terms of uh, mechanism, if we look at the DIC out of plane displacement, we will see the, the blue region, the, the, the arch was moving downward, whereas in the red region, it was moving up, upward and the green shaded area, it was actually showing almost no displacement. So that means that if, if you're loading on the edge, you're actually mobilizing just one section of the arch, whereas the other section is almost not, not moving. Um, and we had a capacity of around 500 newtons. If we move, uh, sorry, before I move on, <laughs> I just wanted to mention in this first load test, uh, we've observed some sliding. So sliding at the springing far from the load and also just behind the load, uh, sorry, below the load. So we're not sure yet if that was due to some bedding in of the arch or it might be due to the 3D response, that's something we need to investigate further. Um, okay, this is look, case two where we were loading at one quarter of the width. So still here, if we look at the DIC um, displacement, so we had a reduced stiffness, um, but the peak load was a bit higher than the previous one. But in terms of mechanism, we are still mobilizing just one section of the arch. Whereas if we move to load case three, when we were loading in the center, we we're actually um, mobilizing the full width of the bridge and we were getting essentially a two dimensional response and the capacity was um, the highest. Again here, going back to the one quarter width on the other side of the arch, capacity was a little bit lower and we were mobilizing just one side and Finally, on the other edge, capacity was even lower, still two-dimensional response. Um, so uh, after this first series, we tested the same arch at three-quarter span. So same locations. Um, so location, uh, sorry, okay, from six to 10. 
And so some of the main findings is that the low capacity, as I said, at the center is higher and it was approximately 20% higher than in the other location, sorry, and then compared to the edge location. Um, and that's something we've observed at both three quarter span and one quarter span. Also, uh, we've seen that the residual deformation from the first loading at one quarter of the span seems to have had a beneficial effect uh, when we were loading at three quarter span. So the capacity was a little bit higher. So if you look at the bar, the blue blue bars, the capacity is a little bit higher. But again, this is something we need to investigate further. These are just some initial results. OK, I'm going to work. Um, so we are planning to do more um, square arch tests, and they will include external spander walls at the edges of the arch and also sun backfill. Uh, but also we would like to do something similar to what we, uh, we well, researchers have done at the University of Sheffield in the past, and that's something Colin presented in the earlier slide. So the idea is to isolate different effects of load transfers. So we have just an example here in the picture on the right hand side, where we were uh, basically um, isolating the effect of the self weight of the soil. Also, we want to model different geometries. So we will have a square, uh, sorry, skew arch, again with spandrels and backfill. Uh, this arch has a span of square span of 750 millimeters and a skew angle of 45 degrees. I just wanted to highlight that the math behind this geometry it was quite complex and it took quite a lot of effort by Lin Wei, who's here. And um, we've just built one section of these arch, as you can see on the right hand side, but obviously the final arch will be wider. And so the design process, uh, the aim was to obtain a geometry where we had just the three uh, shapes for the blocks. So we have the regular block um, and then the half block and this sort of triangular block, which has which was, we, will be at the interface between the arch and the abutment. And the blocks have this uh, twisted shape, which is here. If you want to have a look, we have a sample. Um, OK, conclusions. So, um, so the advantage of uh, small scale tests we have seen is the well, one of the advantages is the rapid turnaround. So this allows us to explore um, a relatively large number of parameters, and these are useful for uh, calibration of numerical models. And also they allow investigation of individual load transfer mechanisms and also more complex scenarios. Um, just uh, some main conclusions from the measuring field tests. So our tests confirmed the uh, significant strengthening effects of backing and internal spandrels. Also, we have seen bridges containing internal spandrels and sun backfill faded in a very hinged, in a very similar hinged mechanism. And uh, however, if we look at the spandrels, they actually provided a greater strengthening effect per unit weight. It was almost double to that provided by the sun. Um, also, we have seen that defect can have uh, a big effect on the failure mode and on the arch capacity. This could range between okay, <laughs> 10 and 75% depending on the practical location. And then finally, 3D okay. tests, we have seen uh, the loading um, location can uh, affect the response and also the capacity. And also we're going to explore the effects of backfill and skew arches. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Serena, for the nice presentation. So now there is time for a few questions. Uh, so just a very quick comment and then a question. The comment is just it'd be really good to see when the results are presented more on those displacements across the 3D arches to understand quite how that load share is happening. So it was, it was shown visibly on your, your colour contours, but some graphs and things would be really helpful. 
And then the question was, apologies, I'm really not quite understanding the difference between the the failure capacity you presented and the capacity per unit width. So I wondered if you could just spell that out for us a little bit. So the, um, with, with these, if you want to go to the slide, the backfield battle is, is covering the, the whole width of the arch. The internal spandrel, it's only covering part of the arch and then there's bare arch either side. So if we just divide by the width of the actual active part of the, of the material. That's yeah. Um, yeah, so on the face of it, the internal spandrels are performing the same as the, as the backfill, but then there's, there's void between them. And it, it's kind of unfair to then say <laughs> you're not performing as well. Uh, and obviously, we'd expect the masonry to be stronger than the backfill because it's going to interlock better. Um, uh, I was going to ask what the what's, what the abutments are, what's, how how stiff the abutments are, and in the two span case, um, I guess it's quite a low pier. Is uh, is the pier? Oh, oh no, it's higher. Okay. So it is quite able to move at the top. Yeah, the pier is able to move. The, the, the abutments, we can either have uh, effectively free to move abutments or we fix them so they're, they're sort of clamped against the, the model frame right. effectively. So I think most of these tests, they're all, the, the abutments were fixed. Yeah. They're basically propped rigidly against the frame so they don't move and we can, we can monitor the movement to make sure they're not moving. But yeah, movement of the abutment does obviously affect the, <laughs> the load capacity quite a bit. All right, another question. Thank you. So in, in developing the models, did you respect any similarity law between the prototype and the scale the model, or just uh, scale the geometry without yeah. caring about the material? Effectively, it's it's, it's uh, because this may have law, there, is, there isn't. It's I mean it's it's mainly frictional op op operational, so friction has no no dimensions. And if we assume the blocks are rigid, the masonry is rigid, then um, that doesn't scale. So the scaling laws are pretty simple. I'm not sure about this. There is a uh, work on branches uh, saying that uh, you should scale uh, either the weight of materials or the strength uh, in order to respect the Cauchy and Freud uh, laws. If we, ha if, we had co if we actually had strength of a material mm. that had units, then that would be valid. But if we just got friction, friction has no units. So the heavier the structure is, right. the more the friction but it just scales. So okay. frictional frictional problems just don't need, you don't need to worry about the scaling law because effectively in your non-dimensional groups, there aren't any. Yeah. <laughs> or well, they're all inherently non-dimensional from the start. Okay, thank you. But if, if we had a clay backfill, for example, or we were we had really, you know, the strength of the, the mortar was significantly important, then that would be, that would be uh, the case. So as I said, with the mortar, we weren't planning to, to model that precisely. So really we have to take care of that in the numerical models that we're not, we're not but that's not a major contribution to the, the strength of these particular models. Okay, so final question. I just wanted to know the units used for the experiments were, were hold or solid units. I mean, on the same line of material models and especially if you are assuming the big units are, are, are stiff or extremely stiff. I mean, the units used in the experiments are hold or solid units. The unit, you mean the vus, the vus, the arch the brick vus units, vus. the brick units. The brick units. Brick. Um, for the plane strain models, they're they're all solid and just full length into the diagram. And obviously, for the three D models, we've got individual blocks across the span. So, does that answer your question, or I'm not sure I quite got that. The brick unit itself. Fully solid or had some holes? No, 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 no holes. No holes. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So okay. we have to move to the next presentation. Thank you very much yeah. again. Thanks. So the next contribution is again on physical testing, but now we move the scale. We move to large scale testing. And uh, the presentation will be delivered by Professor Vasilis Sarosis, Leeds University. Okay, so we can start then. Thank you, Lorenza, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone.
Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, coming from uh, Leeds University, uh, and I'm going to present to you a uh, test that we did, a full-scale test on emission react grids. Uh, I believe now that you are familiar with this uh, diagram here, understanding prediction uh, tools and impact. We are fitting into the large-scale uh, test. Why the pointer is not working? I don't think it works. All right, thank you. Uh, so the principal aim of uh, this presentation is more to, to give you, you know, an indication of the amount of data that we got from testing a large scale uh, uh, bridge. Uh, we paid particular attention into understanding more the 3D effects, uh, as well the accumulation of damage. And uh, also we did this test to support development of high fidelity models developed by Imperial College team. So the bridge that we have constructed in the lab is the three meter span. It includes backfill and spandrels. And it was constructed on a stiff uh, U-shape uh, reinforced concrete uh, test bed. Uh, the bricks that we have used, they were a high strength, uh, low water absorption uh, bricks. Uh, and the backfill was a uh, crust limestone, so granular material. Uh, we applied the different types of uh, loads. Uh, in particular, point loads uh, at different locations and different magnitudes. And uh, this varies from what uh, already is happening in the literature, where it's mainly concentrating on a line load. Uh, so this is like a, an image showing uh, the lab that we have at uh, the University of Leeds. As you can see, uh, it's quite large, and uh, we have a reinforced concrete, uh, a strong floor uh, here, a series of uh, anchored uh, points. Uh, uh, approximately 1.5 meters uh, apart. Uh, so we can uh, perform a series of tests, including uh, static and cyclic uh, tests. So the first thing that uh, we have to do was uh, to construct the U-shaped uh, reinforced concrete uh, tents bed uh, to ensure that uh, the bridge is uh, restrained and there are no movements, especially from the backfield, from the sides. Uh, we have to uh, construct it, design it uh, using a dense reinforcement uh, arrangement uh, for both uh, the base and the uh, retaining walls, the walls. The thickness of uh, the base uh, was uh, 300 millimeter, uh, while that of the walls was uh, 540 millimeters. And then we have designed it uh, to C30 uh, grade concrete. So this uh, slide here showing you the design and construction, uh, actually showing uh, the construction drawings uh, of uh, the National React bridge that uh, we have uh, constructed and tested in the lab. Uh, so you can see it is like, uh, uh, the bridge is like almost six meters long, uh, two meters in high, and uh, the width uh, is uh, 2.9 meters. Uh, the art span is uh, three meters, and we have used uh, a single ring uh, header bonded uh, arch barrel, so one brick, uh, so it's like uh, 215 millimeter, and the span to rise ratio is 41. And with respect to the abutments, uh, we have uh, used the uh, uh, two brick thick uh, abutments, and uh, it was uh, eight courses at the height. And the backfill, as I said, was a uh, grass limestone, uh, mod uh, uh, one, uh, and then the thickness. From the ground to the top, it was uh, 300 millimeters. Uh, and yes, type A engineering bricks. And then the mortar we have used uh, was uh, type uh, O, uh, which is uh, 1 to 2 to 9, uh, cement to lime to uh, sun. This slide shows you uh, the arrangement, the construction arrangement uh, of uh, the masonry that we have constructed uh, in the lab. Uh, so you can see the the abutments here. We had to cut them. Uh, I use the pointer here. So we had to cut the abutments uh, here at an angle, so the arch uh, sits nicely there. Uh, about uh, the arch ring, it was a single ring uh, arch barrel. Uh, and then for the spandrels, we have uh, constructed it using a one and a half brick thick uh, spandrels. Uh, so this is like. Uh, so this is a photogrammetric model that we did of uh, the National Arts Bridge. So you can see the backfill at top and uh, the arch, the test bed, 
Uh, the strong flow is this one, and then the best was there, you say, uh, really was concrete. Uh, so this is the construction process that we have followed. Uh, first, we have uh, constructed uh, the apartments and the lower spandrel walls. Uh, then uh, we uh, positioned the centering here, uh, where the centering was uh, sitting on a series of uh, poles. Uh, it was a bespoke centering uh, system that uh, we have developed here. Uh, oops, sorry. We have uh, started compacting once we have finished uh, the spandrels and the, the lower the, the abutments and the lower spandrels. We started backfilling uh, that area, so we have used like a trench runner uh, for the compaction, and then uh, at the corners we use like a plate uh, trench, uh, so to be sensitive close to uh, the masonry area. Uh, in total, we have uh, deposited more or less 30 tons of limestone uh, in the grass limestone in the arts. Uh, as a backfill, uh, and uh, yes, then uh, we have started constructing uh, the ring, and then uh, together with the ring, we have started raising the spandrels, as uh, you can see here, and then we started backfilling. Backfilling was happening into layers, 110 millimeters. It was quite important for us to ensure that compaction is even uh, among the arts. So this is a time lapse of uh, the construction process, as you can see here. So we have used scaffolding around to its uh, areas of the top. Uh, yeah. uh, also at the corners, you can see here the white. These are the uh, polyester iron uh, plates. Uh, they were placed uh, at the corners uh, where the reinforced concrete uh, wall and the brickwork uh, is, uh, uh, is there. So that was more to avoid any hard contact between the brickwork and the reinforced concrete uh, wall. Uh, we also uh, constructed a steel reaction frame uh, that was designed in order to mount the actuators and to apply the load. And uh, so you can see here the gate at the left hand side is like a 6.2 meters uh, long by 4 meters high by 3.52 meters uh, width. Uh, both columns and beams, they were all I sections, and then actuators could be mounted to any position along the Transverse peaks, so we have a series of transverse peaks that can move across, maybe like the center line of center uh, on the top or the south. Uh, yeah, and actuators can be placed at any location, so it was quite flexible system that we had uh, to design there. With respect to instrumentation, uh, it was quite heavy. We had used a series of uh, instrumentations like displacement transducers combined with uh, accelerometers. Uh, we did the GPR survey, uh, DIC system, as well as uh, laser scanning. Uh, laser scanning was happening in GPR before testing, and uh, also after the application of each load, we have performed skills. Of <laughs> no problem. A series of uh, scans. Uh, what we did also, so we tried the different methods, you know, to try to understand and capture some. Uh, uh, yeah, properties there. So we have painted the north face of the arch white, so the, the cracks were more visible, uh, while the south face was uh, left uh, unpainted. And the main reason was to use it with the, the DIC system and to capture any uh, strain movement. Uh, so you can see here the array of the displacement transducers. We have a, a, an extensive uh, array, especially. Uh, at the intradus of the arch, so you can see at the quarter span, at the, the mid span, and the, the three quarter span, as well as we have quite a few at the spandrels, uh, mainly to observe any out of plane uh, movement, but uh, also any horizontal movement uh, that uh, occurring during the application of the load. To monitor the displacement of uh, the RCU frame, it was important also to include some displacement transducers here at the top. Uh, as well as at the base, uh, to see if there is uh, any potential uplift uh, of uh, the base lab. Uh, together with the construction of the arts, we have uh, constructed some uh, small-scale specimens to perform some uh, material characterization tests. I will not go through into detail here, but you can see a list. Uh, just to highlight that the brick was quite strong, 111 uh, megapascal, young modules also it was quite high. We observe flexural strength of uh, mortar, frictional characteristics uh, of the brick-to-mortar interface, as well as cohesion. 
of uh, the murder. Uh, something that is novel as part of this material characterization that uh, has not been done in the literature, it was to identify the frictional characteristics between uh, the arch ring to the back ring, as well as back ring with the spandrels. So we have devised you know, an experimental set on a large shear box, uh, and we uh, obtain some results for different backfill properties and different construction methods that you can see here. Further information are provided in these few uh, papers there, if anyone is interested. Uh, so this is, uh, I'll move now into the loading uh, uh, protocol that we did. So we performed a series of tests, uh, low-level tests. So we loaded the bridge up to 150 kilonewton from different uh, locations. Uh, so we were loading under quasi static conditions uh, once, and then we were performing three quasi static cycles after that. Uh, then we did the, so we started from A and B positions here, and then we went to C, D, E, F, uh, and then A, A and B actually they were trials, and then we went back to A and B, and then G, H, and I. Uh, then we went to the mid-level test, uh, in which we started from G, so we went from the south side, uh, close to the spandrels, G, A, D, and then we went to the north side, S, I, C, and then the middle line, the central line, E, H, B. Uh, we also performed a high-level test, the location B, that said Porter Spar, uh, and then uh, we failed the bridge at the same position, point B, and then applied load at the opposite corner at three quarters, at point, uh, sorry, at point eight, uh, and load it again the bridge to failure. Uh, so I will show you some of these results. Uh, initially, I will show you the crack patterns that uh, we have observed. So you can see here the crack patterns at low levels of load. What was found uh, from uh, the low level test at different locations, as I mentioned, was that the, the cracks observed that they were extremely low hairline cracks that they, they were closing after the application of uh, the load. Uh, with the removal of the load, cracks closed, as mentioned. And then first crack observed uh, at the position when we applied the load at position uh, D, and that was the separation of the arch ring to the spandrel. What we observed is that when you apply the load, this low load up to 150 at the quarter span, uh, there is no crack uh, observed. However, if you apply the load at the, uh, the ground close to the spandrel, then there is this detachment. Uh, and probably this is due to the fact that uh, at that location, the depth of the backfill is quite low, it's 300 millimeter, and this is what created this uh, detachment. Uh, so I'm showing you here the first crack that we have observed uh, under low uh, level test conditions. Uh, that was the first crack, it's quite, uh, yeah. Uh, small like a hairline crack. Uh, it happened at 60 kilonewton, uh, and we saw the separation. So these are some low displacement uh, curves. So this is load against displacement curve that we have observed at point 27. So the application of load was at point 28. Uh, so this is the low displacement curve very close to the spandrel. So you can see clearly the change of uh, the formation, change of stiffness uh, here occurring which indicates the development of the crack. Uh, and then this is the low displacement curve at the point 0.28, exactly under the point low. Uh, now moving to the mid-level tests, uh, we have observed again a series of uh, uh, cracks uh, here. The, the mid-level test was up to 250 kN. This is not even close to the half of the ultimate load, uh, 150 kN. So when testing the bridge at the uh, location uh, G, we identify some hinge forming, uh, so you can see here. So you can see here the hinge is uh, forming, uh, and then when we have repeated this quasi-static cyclic, uh, it propagated to a diagonal crack. Uh, then we move the actuator to point A, and uh, we have performed. Uh, yeah, and you can see again a series of uh, uh, hinges forming here, like a hinge uh, formation here with the application of cyclic load leading to. A diagonal crack again. Uh, then at point F, uh, it was uh, detachment. The, the detachment of the spandrel uh, propagated uh, along the corners. Uh, and uh, what was quite interesting is the fact that uh, uh, we found. Uh, wait a second. Uh, the, the fact that uh, we found like. Uh, 
uh, is there load here occurring? It's like a, a, an alpha edge look like a localized shear phenomenon occurring there, and this is uh, where the actuator was applied. Uh, so, yeah, when uh, we move into the center line, uh, again, we have uh, observed this uh, uh, localized shear phenomenon there, and then when we move to the uh, right and left uh, side, uh, we are starting to observe in here some, uh, let's say, 3D effects uh, on uh, the cracking behavior. So there are some uh, branches uh, moving outside from the hinge. Uh, the same when we apply to the other side. So in a way, uh, about the mid-level test, the behavior was more, was more or less symmetrical when you apply to the north side and to the south side. Uh, at the high levels, uh, high level of load, uh, point uh, B, uh, the, the cracks in red uh, identified, the cracks in uh, black uh, are the ones that uh, are from the previous uh, test. So you can see here the 3D phenomena are even more uh, observed here, as well as the initiation of some diagonal cracking uh, at this fountain. Uh, so we, at point B, we applied the load again and we brought the bridge into uh, failure. At failure, we had a quite significant amount of uh, cracking observed, uh, again indicating 3D effects, but also we had uh, some uh, cracking at the abutment, so probably this into the uh, rotation uh, of the right hand side uh, of uh, the arts here, uh, creating some uh, uplift here yeah. and uh, developing this uh, tensile uh, cracks. Uh, when we move the load to the location eight, uh, again, a similar response uh, was found. Uh, so you can see here again the track propagation. Uh, so it was quite interesting that some uh, spalling also was observed uh, the mortar uh, during the cracks. So this is like a 3D model that we did showing the, the cracks that we have identified at the end of all these uh, experiments that we did on this uh, masonry arts bit. Uh, so talking now about the load displacement curves, uh, so you can see here the, the load displacement curve at point B. Uh, so this is like the ultimate, the first ultimate test uh, that we did. So we reach a uh, load up to 639 kilometer. Uh, the application of the load was like a load control, uh, a displacement control in this case. Uh, and what we have observed here, so this is the failure mechanism, is that uh, uh, the hinge is hinge one and hinge three, they were very close together, uh, especially hinge three is like at the mid span. We were, we were supposed to expect that uh, a bit further uh, on the right, but probably that was the reason because we have performed a series of tests before. So it wasn't like uh, a virgin bridge that uh, was testing under uh, quarter span uh, load. In this diagram, you can see the separation, uh, the detachment of uh, the arts ring uh, with uh, the spandrel uh, wall. And then when we move to the point eight and apply it again, the load, uh, we reach a load of uh, 575 kilonewton. Uh, so again, the four hinge uh, behavior has uh, been observed here and uh, some nice significant diagonal grabbing at the spandrels as well. Uh, what is important is, I mentioned before also about uh, the crossing of the mortar. So you can see here a view of the introduce where crossing of the mortar is uh, occurring. Uh, and then this is another view also of the uh, left side, uh, again showing the separation of uh, the arts ring with the spandrel, as well as the development of this diagonal crack uh, uh, from the mid span, from the quarter span to the top. Uh, I mentioned about the rotations also, so this is a video showing uh, the rotation, so the uplift of uh, the abutment, so this is the abutment shown uh, at the left hand side here, this abutment, uh, so you can see the rotation of it uh, and the side crack uh, forming there. And this is like a video showing uh, the test, uh, the first ultimate test uh, from the north side uh, of the bridge. What was quite interesting when we applied the second ultimate uh, test on the other side was uh, the development of some shear cracks at the backfield. So you can see here this diagonal shear crack uh, that propagates 
from the spreader load uh, to the abutment. Uh, so this is probably due to significant drop also in the care uh, here. Uh, we also did some uh, GPR survey before and after, as I mentioned before. So and here we see from the GPR survey that we did that uh, uh, there is a change uh, to the layer immediately above the arch uh, at point B, uh, as well as the symmetry of the arch at point C is uh, changing and there's significant deformation, uh, as you can see uh, at this branch here. Uh, so the left is uh, before and uh, uh, one of the right is after damage. Uh, so in this slide, I'm uh, summarizing some of the results. So the, the first column is 535, is uh, the load that we have observed at the uh, high level load. Uh, at ultimate one, 639 and then 0.87575. So what I would like to highlight here is that the steepness is quite high. When you have at uh, point A, uh, point B, the high level load and then it's reducing uh, during the argument and you can see also the really deformations here. I have to wrap up. Also, in terms of spandrel walls, we found the failure mechanism of both uh, sliding and tilting. So you can see here some of the values that we have observed uh, from the out of plane deformation. Of course, the, the location that you are applying the load you have more out of plane deformation of the spandrels. In terms of the horizontal displacement, uh, this is like a in plane deformation at peak against all the experiments, the 25 experiments. So you can observe that at low and medium level, there were almost no deformation in, in, in plane deformation of the spandrels. That was quite a lot, though, at the ultimate load, uh, up to 8 millimeters. And uh, I'm almost finishing now. So this is uh, the, one of the last slides showing the crack, crack width that uh, we have observed. At the end of the, all the experiments, we observed that the uh, north side of uh, the reels uh, was more damaged than the south side. And here, the maximum crack that uh, crack width that we have observed was 5.546 millimeters. And uh, at the right hand side, you can see the outer frame deformation. The maximum was uh, 20.48, 20.5 uh, millimeters at the top. So as conclusions, uh, we have constructed like a, a, a full scale measuring arts busy in uh, the lab. Um, what we observed was that um, separation of the spandrel wall and the arts ring before the formation of any visible hinges within the arts uh, identified. Uh, both pill and spandrel were contributing to the strength of uh, the bridge. Um, we had some 3D response uh, also at the, the medium level, and then at the ultimate load, it was more like a 2D uh, mode of uh, failure response. Uh, although we had failed the bridge, when we failed it from the other side, it can reach some residual capacity up to 90%, and that is quite significant. And the next test that we're going to do is uh, like uh, we're going to repeat the same dimensions of the bridge, but we're going to apply some cyclic load uh, this time. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues also and the clinicians uh, for this. And any questions? Sorry for being late. Thank you, Mercedes. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. So, see many hands there. So, yeah. Thank you, Vasilis, for your nice presentation. And um, I have just a curiosity. The backfield is uh, directly in contact with the vertical reinforced concrete walls. And uh, yeah. in your yeah. opinion, is, is there any effect of the vertical walls uh, stiffness uh, on the response of the bridge? Well, I cannot say yes or no at this stage. But the way we have tried to design and based on the numerical model, still we are, to be honest, still we are analyzing data, yes? So these are some data. So the experiment finished in uh, July, so still analyzing the data. Oh. Uh, but what I can say uh, from the numerical models that we did, so we have uh, quite a lot of uh, distance uh, from the abutment to the uh, reinforced concrete wall. So there is no influence. Uh, yeah, yeah. Area of influence. And mainly the loads that uh, we were focusing were quarter span, mid span. So they were not outside uh, of uh, the span of the bridge. So in a way, it doesn't affect. But 
to prove that using measurement, I think we need to do a bit more uh, processing of the data. Okay, yeah, thank you. Process. Question here. Yeah. Hi, Vasilis. I'm Gemma Wood, Conservation Accredited Engineer. Um, thanks for a fantastic presentation there. Um, I've just got one thing to kind of note, and that is in relation to your model, there's a lot of really good information there that would help kind of some of the people that are out in the field inspecting these bridges in relation to the way that that behaved as it started to approach failure, some of the cracking that occurred, the patterns of those cracking, and especially in relation to the spandrel oil, the movement of that and the ways that it can move. Um, I'm just wondering kind of as you develop these papers, whether there could be kind of something added in relation to kind of helping the guys that are out on site inspecting these structures and trying to kind of work out what's going wrong. And uh, if there's kind of a need to worry before we get to failure. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I think that, that's the purpose of this project also to provide some uh, possible guidelines at the end uh, from the significant findings that they have found. Also, these specific tests have been constructed and tested in a way that they can be used by numerical modelers to validate their numerical models. So all the data will become open access, uh, you know, after we finish the project and uh, we have a plan to do so. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks for this. The, the, the Hamish Malvi Balavi Associates. Um, your low load was a 15 kilonewton patch that already caused some cracking. Is that, did I understand that right? Uh, just a second. Uh, the the low, low load, uh, so you're referring to here, yes. Uh, so Sorry, 150. The low tons. level load we have applied 150 kilonewtons, and it was a, a patch load 300 by 300. So the load uh, platter was 300 by 300 millimeters. Uh, so the crack that we have observed in this case was a detachment of uh, the spandrel. Uh, yeah, and just, uh, I'm intrigued that obviously that's um, more than a standard axle on a 300 square patch. Um, so you could argue that it wasn't a particularly low load, and it might be quite interesting to look at deflections under low, lower loads that don't generate visible cracking before you move on to them. Yes, that's true. Yeah, we can look at that. Uh, perhaps, uh, so, as I mentioned before, well, what we found is like when you apply the same load at point A here, which is at quarter span, uh, there was no cracking observed. Only when you move that into the ground to the mid span, because the, the depth of uh, the buffing there is quite low, 300 millimeters, then you have the first ground with urine. So that was quite interesting for us to find out. Okay, final question. <clears throat> um, were any tap tests carried out to the Intrados? I know that your arch barrel is keyed or bond you know there's a bond between the two rings as it were there's no continuous mortar joint but but was there any was there any hollow brickwork in the soffit okay because the intention was to identify failure at the mortar and the land of bricks because this is what most often it's happening in practice also. You can tell you it's a mortar. And very weak mortar also. Okay, thank you very much. So thank we can conclude here. Yeah. So we move now to the third presentation. So it is uh, on the work of Dr. Enrico Tubaldi from University of Strathclyde. Is again on mainstream bridges, but uh, the topic is slightly different. The focus is on uh, scour. Wait, can you hear me? Okay, thank you, Lorenzo, for the introduction. And uh, it's a, let me start the presentation. Oh, no, it's good. 
Yeah, it's a real uh, pleasure for me to deliver this presentation today because it is right here at Imperial College that I, starting, I started in 2015 the research on Bridge Scour, thanks to my Curie Fellowship that uh, permitted me to join the group of Lorenzo and Professor Izudin. Since then, I moved to Strathclyde, advanced a lot in the research, and, uh, and now I'm sharing with you the, uh, the most recent advancement on this, as well as some results from uh, past works. So this is the outline of the presentation. I will start with a brief introduction of the, to the problem of bridge scour, and then I will move on an analysis of the effects of scour on mesory arch bridges, then illustrate a bit um, uh, some monitoring approaches available uh, for monitoring scour, and uh, finally, uh, the monitoring system we developed at the University of Strathclyde. So, uh, bridge scour, I think most of you are familiar with this problem. Uh, many presenters have already uh, mentioned how uh, this is a, a real issue for many bridges. Anyway, just to recap, scour is the removal of bad materials around bridge foundations uh, during uh, floods. And uh, there are different types of scour, but the most important one is the local scour that arises uh, uh, due to the presence of uh, some major structures that uh, constitute an obstacle uh, to the flow. Uh, normal flow of the river, and this results in formation of turbulence and removal of sediments around the bridge foundations. Oops. So, uh, scour is uh, the leading cause of bridge failure worldwide. In the US, they record uh, almost uh, 20, if not more, bridge failures every year. Here in the UK, more than one bridge failure per year. Similarly, in Italy, in the last two, uh, year, there have been two bridge failures, and uh, one in Calabria actually was a newly built bridge. And uh, uh, the, 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 scour, uh, the trend of, of scour failure is expected to increase due to climate change effects, bringing more intense floods and also an higher rate of occurrence of floods, but also because of uh, the reduction of resources available uh, to uh, transport agencies and operators in order to mitigate the impact of this hazard. Uh, it seems that I'm a bit haunted by the problem of bridge scour. You see on the left, uh, Rubianello Bridge, a bridge uh, located not far from my hometown back in Italy, that collapsed during a heavy flood. And then on the right, Lamington Viaduct, another bridge in Scotland, again, 15 minutes from my new home in Glasgow. It didn't <laughs> collapse, but... <laughs> but, uh, uh, I mean, the, the closure of the bridge and the downtime uh, was uh, terrible, uh, resulting in lots of losses to network rail. Uh, they can confirm people attending here. So uh, rather than for me, the problem is uh, this is an issue for transport agencies that need to invest lots of money in uh, uh, prioritizing, uh, first of all, uh, the, the bridges that are more at risk and, uh, and uh, intervening and mitigating uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the effect of the hazard. So as a researcher, I, uh, I've tried to address uh, a series of challenges, uh, starting from the evaluation of the vulnerability and risk of bridges as opposed to floods and scour. And then uh, I looked at uh, uh, ways to improve current procedures for long-term bridge risk management and rapid response to floods. Uh, I, I contributed to the development of innovative and low-cost sensing strategies for monitoring scour critical bridges, and uh, uh, I tried to quantify uh, in a rigorous way the benefits of structural monitoring in managing uh, uh, bridge scour risk uh, in order to make uh, uh, monitoring more acceptable to transport agencies. And uh, in doing this, uh, I've been uh, collaborating with uh, uh, lots of academics and other uh, industry partners, as well as uh, transport agencies. And this is uh, a recent outcome, uh, an horizon scanning paper, where we highlight challenges and future directions improving bridge resilience. This is the link to the paper. It's open access. Uh, you are welcome to have a look at it if interested. So let's move now. Oops, I don't know why this goes far. To the analysis of the effects of scour on mesory arch bridges. And uh, as already said a um, few times uh, during these events, uh, mesory arch bridges are uh, quite vulnerable to the problem of scour because they are built uh, on shallow foundations or on timber piles that uh, with time may have uh, decayed or, or rotten. They are overall rigid structures that uh, uh, do not easily accommodate settlements. And also they are structures that uh, are aged have a lifetime higher often than 100 years, so they already exhibit some sign of degradation and distress due to other causes. 
Uh, oops, you see here some example of uh, notable uh, uh, bridge failures uh, in, in the UK. I could have brought more cases, but uh, what, what I want to highlight here is that uh, uh, we can observe some recurrent uh, failure mechanisms uh, where the, uh, the most damaged components are those uh, located upstream of the bridge. And, uh, and this is because uh, the SCAWA roll is uh, obviously deeper on the upstream side of the bridge. And this uh, results in the formation of three dimensional mechanisms that uh, uh, interest uh, the various components uh, of, of the bridges. And uh, as you see here in the case of both multi span bridges as well as uh, single span bridges. And so, uh, oops, here I want to highlight uh, the importance. Uh, of uh, employing uh, a three dimensional, I don't know what's happening, sorry about this. This went into another <laughs> presentation, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> Is it the point that maybe that's messing up? So I need to go up. So I will probably try not to move too much. Use the point. Okay, sorry about this. So uh, I don't know what's happening. Sorry, I should have uh, tested this uh, before. Okay. I don't know it's patient. Hopefully, yeah, he won't move. So, yeah, some researchers uh, have studied the problem employing two dimensional mechanisms, but uh, yeah, very often uh, records to three dimensional uh, analysis and mechanism is unavoidable due to the nature of uh, the SCAWA role and, uh, and the effects that uh, it imparts on, on, on bridges. Oops, then the problem is my presentation, I guess. Sorry. So, uh, because SCOWAR uh, affects the various components of the bridge, it is necessary to, to develop three-dimensional models that account for the contribution and interaction of the various components. In this workshop, uh, they, they have already highlighted the, the various approaches that are available uh, for research uh, uh, purposes, uh, but also yeah, to, to practitioners for modeling uh, multi-span uh, multi bridges ranging from micro-scale models to uh, macro models and discrete element models. And uh, uh, when I was uh, here at Imperial, we analyzed the failure of a Copri bridge, which is a listed bridge in Yoshen that collapsed during boxing day flood in 2015. And uh, the, the failure mechanism of this bridge is uh, typical of this type of bridge is uh, supposed to uh, scour at the base of the pier with formation of diagonal cracks uh, in the ash barrel that uh, expand the eventual interest also uh, go up to the surface. So uh, to analyze this, uh, we develop this uh, three-dimensional uh, model employing a mesoscale approach like the one showed by, uh, by Lorenzo earlier for describing the mesory components. Uh, at the time, the, the modeling of the expander was, was not uh, as advanced as it is now. Nevertheless, the focus here was on uh, uh, the soil structure interaction problem, the effects of SCAWAR. And for describing the interaction between the foundation and the soil, we employed a Winkler type of approach, so simple springs. And uh, for describing the SCAWAR uh, effects, uh, we, we define a, a SCAWAR all shape that is uh, informed by flume testing on, uh, on uh, peers in a laboratory uh, analysis. And uh, this uh, shape is kept uh, constant and is controlled mainly by the maximum scour depth that was increased progressively uh, during the, the analysis. And all the springs that fall inside within the scour hole are progressively removed. And uh, with this approach, we are able to capture not only the loss of support uh, due to uh, erosion, uh, due to scour, but also uh, to capture naturally the settlements uh, induced on the superstructure. And uh, as a result, you see uh, the result of the application of, of, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, analysis, of this uh, modeling strategy that can capture the formation of uh, these uh, vertical settlements uh, accompanied by rotational settlements <coughs> towards the upstream side <coughs> of the bridge. 
and uh, the model can capture the formation of the diagonal crack uh, initiating uh, in the piers and then uh, interesting also uh, the arch barrel. Very important are these results showing how the settlements, uh, in this case the vertical settlements, but also other kinematic parameters uh, for increasing level of scour, initially are very low until the scour depth reaches at this point uh, uh, the starts to discover all, start to undermine the foundation at the base. And uh, you see that uh, at this point, uh, by increasing uh, scour, uh, the scour depth, uh, we have uh, a sort of cliff edge effect with a sudden increase uh, of uh, uh, the, the, form the displacements in the bridge, uh, but also the damage and the deformations. And uh, so small increases of the scour depth result in uh, significant increases of displacements. And uh, this, uh, this analysis, the results of this analysis, suggest that uh, masonry arch bridges provide a little warning uh, of being in a critical condition. And so they start to displace, to move a lot when they are approaching a critical condition. So this has an impact on uh, uh, the development of monitoring strategies for capturing uh, uh, the, the, the some critical condition for bridges as opposed to scour. Oops. Similar results were obtained from the analysis of this other bridge, the Bianello Bridge. For this bridge, uh, we were able uh, to uh, perform some ambient vibration uh, testing uh, with accelerometers placed uh, on the remaining portion of the bridge, flat jack test in order to uh, fully characterize as much as we could the mechanical properties uh, of, of, the, of the remaining portion of the structure. And, and, and so we built a nonlinear three dimensional model in Abacus that was uh, calibrated. Uh, uh, and validated against the, uh, the experimental model analysis, uh, operational model analysis results. Oh, I'm really sorry for this. And uh, these are uh, some results of the analysis of the impact of SCOWAR uh, at uh, the, the, the base of the pier where uh, collapse was initiated. Again, we observe uh, uh, no displacements and almost uh, no damage uh, in the bridge uh, up to uh, the point when uh, the scour all starts to undermine uh, the pier. And at this point, uh, uh, things progress very quickly, very rapidly. And so we have uh, this sudden increase of uh, displacements and, uh, and the damage. That if I use this, no, it just wants to. Go rapidly. Yeah, that could be an option. So, yeah, maybe closing the other one. Huh? No. Yeah, and then would be helpful. Maybe still not shared. Okay, and then you are in the presentation. I should have uploaded the PDF, maybe. But it's strange in my computer, it has no issues. Right. Yes, seems to work now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, that's so strange, the mysteries of PowerPoint. If I do this, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I will uh, proceed. Uh, yeah, we want to the presentation mode. I think it's better, less uh, stressful to everybody. So, monitoring approaches. Uh, there are essentially two types of monitoring approaches for uh, bridges exposed to scour. We have uh, direct uh, approaches using, for example, ground penetrating radars, sonars, magnetic sliding collars, flat out devices, electrical conductivity probes. All, all these uh, uh, types of sensors measure directly scour at a given location. They are characterized by different level of accuracy and resolution. But in any case, they, they, they have this uh, common thread. To, uh, on the other hand, there are indirect approaches uh, that uh, measure uh, either uh, 
uh, the causes of scour. So, for example, uh, the river flow properties or the effect of scour, like uh, uh, inclination of, of a bridge or accelerometer of the pier, uh, accelerometers measuring accelerations and then uh, decay of abrasion frequency or uh, uh, other tools that uh, can be used for, for measuring uh, uh, the displacements induced by scour. A strap uh, we initially uh, develop a, a, a pilot scour sensing system using uh, uh, a commercial sensor, the EnviroScan, which is this probe here, used uh, in agriculture for detecting uh, uh, the, the, the level of water in soils. And we have repurposed it in order to, uh, to detect not only scour, but also water levels at a particular location where the, the probe is installed, as well as the deposition of soil that often follows uh, scour. And this probe, two probes actually, uh, were in installed in 2019 uh, uh, in, a, in a location in New Cannock, not no far from Glasgow. One probe was installed in front of this Masonry Arch Bridge Pier. Another probe was installed on, on another pedestrian bridge that is located just upstream of, of, of this bridge and provides information. Uh, uh, the first one on uh, total scour, the, the second one uh, only on degradation scour. These probes uh, have provided us with uh, continuum uh, uh, measurements uh, of the evolution of, of the riverbed properties as well as uh, of the water levels uh, during the year with some interaction due to uh, COVID and due to uh, need, the need of replacing uh, batteries. Nevertheless, they didn't detect much scour with just uh, one exception for the scour probe located upstream of the second bridge. Some minor scour of 30 centimeters was detected and we went to site to validate these measurements manually. And uh, uh, now we are installing, uh, uh, with the help of Transport Scotland, uh, more scour probes at two other bridges uh, that are located not far from the previous one. And uh, we are very excited about this uh, because, uh, especially in this location, uh, there is a live bed scour where, where basically there is a continuous evolution of the, of the scour hole uh, during subsequent floods. Um, these bridges are classified at high risk of scour, but uh, uh, the, the, the uh, traffic is not allowed anymore over them. So th this constitutes really, uh, really good case studies for uh, testing uh, alternative uh, monitoring uh, strategies. Uh, you may notice here uh, that uh, the inspections that we took uh, initially when we thought started to design the system uh, occurred in 2020. So it took uh, almost three years to, to reach the stage where now finally we are installing the probes. And uh, this gives you an idea of how difficult it is uh, the process of getting permissions from environmental agencies to install the probes in the riverbed and the construction process itself, because the installation of these probes uh, required uh, very extensive scaffoldings that, in my opinion, were not necessary. Uh, anyway, uh, it's been a very stressful uh, uh, process. And uh, because of this also, we started uh, thinking at alternative strategies for monitoring the scour that do not require the installation of the sensors within the riverbed. So we're talking about remote sensing strategies. And uh, starting from the basic one, which uh, uses uh, uh, an ultrasonic transducers, that's user that monitors only the river level. Uh, so we have uh, installed uh, three river track uh, sensors that are LoRa one sensors, very cheap. We're talking about 250 pounds for the sensor that uh, transmits real time data to uh, not via the 4G network, but via the LoRa one network. Good luck to, to find uh, <laughs> coverage for this in remote locations. Uh, anyway, uh, we have also installed uh, cameras and we are uh, uh, employing uh, some particle uh, image velocimetry analysis uh, for, uh, uh, for estimating uh, the surface uh, field, uh, velocity field in, in, in the, of, of the water in correspondence of the bridge. Alternatively, we have also got uh, radar velocity sensors that are much more expensive. And uh, also we are trialing uh, sonars and uh, fish finders, commercial fish, find, fish finders uh, that cost uh, really little but uh, I've been found to be uh, very accurate in uh, evaluating the, the, the riverbed level and uh, even scour. So the idea behind these remote sensing strategies is that uh, uh, we can combine the, the observation they provide, not directly on scour, but on uh, the, 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 the causes of scour, 
and uh, combine them with uh, uh, hydraulic models, scour models, uh, or alternatively machine learning uh, based models that uh, do not involve any physical uh, process. So combine them in order to achieve uh, uh, real-time estimate uh, uh, of, the, of the evolution of the scour at the base uh, of the bridge pier and uh, or alternatively forecast uh, of, of the evolution of the scour if data from Met Office, uh, for example, and warning on uh, precipitation levels uh, are uh, obtained and propagated through the use of hydraulic models. And then uh, I had the opportunity to lead this European project uh, where basically we went to uh, Thessaloniki, uh, a field test facility, Europroteas, where there was uh, this uh, structural float type, not exactly uh, a bridge, but uh, no, no, not too different, a big mass at the top, and uh, let's call it uh, yeah, uh, a bridge pier and the foundation. And uh, we, were, uh, uh, we did excavate uh, manually uh, the soil below the foundation, and uh, we measured the, the changes in, uh, in, uh, in the dynamic properties of the system uh, through the use of accelerometers and performing uh, operational model analysis. Uh, we did also do some uh, modeling uh, of, this, uh, of this system using different types of strategies. Nevertheless, uh, the, the important result that we came with is that we observed a, a consistent reduction of uh, vibration frequency of the system uh, for increasing level of scour that are described by this ratio between uh, S is the, the, the penetration, horizontal penetration of scour, and B is the uh, foundation width. So uh, basically what we observed is that when one quarter of the foundation uh, is undermined, there is a reduction of frequency of 20%, which is uh, quite uh, significant. So this is a way indirectly to detect scour. And uh, we have also done some numerical analysis of Rubianello Bridge, looking at uh, uh, the changes of vibration frequency uh, on, on this bridge model for increasing level of scour. And you see how this Mesori Bridge exhibits a higher sensitivity uh, to the effect of scour in terms of vibration frequency compared to the previous system. And the reason behind it is that the scour not only results in a reduction of the stiffness of the system because you are removing basically some uh, support conditions, but also in damage of the bridge cracking that is reflected again in a reduction of frequency of the system. So, uh, Meso Yarch Bridge is exhibit even mm -hmm. And uh, we also uh, got another European project that is starting soon and will uh, allow us to access to the newly built Soil Foundation Structural International Laboratory in uh, University of Bristol, where we will uh, build uh, a scaled model of uh, real uh, bridge and uh, with, with all the soil uh, contained in a laminar box and we will be able to perform uh, further tests in order to look at the changes in dynamic behavior for this system and the, the project is going to start very soon. So finally, in the last five minutes, I want to illustrate a bit uh, the monitoring system we developed at the University of Strathclyde. The idea, the base of the system is that uh, uh, deploying the scour sensors at every uh, location at every bridge that is at high risk of scour is economically unsustainable. And uh, so we have been trying to think of ways to uh, overcome this limitation. And, we, and, uh, and uh, basically the idea is to exploit uh, scour monitoring sensors only at limited and critical locations within a bridge network. And then uh, uh, use hydraulic and structural models uh, if necessary and uh, an probabilistic approach in order to extend the information from monitored locations to locations that are not directly monitored. The tool that we proposed for doing this is a Bayesian network. Bayesian network is uh, this graphical tool uh, that provides a representation of the different variables that are involved in the problem. So we have uh, variables like the water depth or the discharge or the river, other variables are the contraction scour and the local scour that together summed up give the, you know, the uh, total scour at different uh, locations of the submerged substructures. And, uh, and these are all the note, the so-called conditional relationship between the variables that is described using uh, uh, hydraulic models, for example. And in particular, this network was built, built by embedding uh, the models from BB9712, that is the, the, the code uh, used here in the UK for uh, rating uh, highway bridges uh, at risk of power. And uh, the idea of this uh, approach 
is that uh, we enter with observation from gauging stations or from the scour probe at the critical location where we install uh, the probe, and through the network performing Bayesian learning, we are able to extend this information to other unmonitored locations. So starting from a uh, probability distribution of scour depth that is characterized by significant dispersion, reflecting our uncertainty in the knowledge of scour, introducing the observation at this appear, we are able to update the knowledge of the uh, probability distribution of scour at the other peer, and you see how this is uh, more or less located in correspondence of the measured uh, scour depth for the other peer, but is still characterized by some uncertainty that is, however, reduced compared to the initial a priori estimate. The network can then be extended to incorporate also uh, uh, the variables from other bridges, and, uh, and these are the outcomes of the application of the method uh, to, to this small network of bridges. And uh, with this approach, basically, uh, we, we are also uh, aiming at update and improve the estimates of uh, SCOUR provided by the models embedded in between 97 and 12. They are well known to be affected by significant uh, bias, so a degree of conservativeness and uncertainty. So this approach, uh, whenever information is entered into the system, allows to improve the models that uh, are embedded in the codes. And uh, with this, uh, we can. Uh, develop. Oh, no, I'm going to skip this. Sorry, no time. Okay. And uh, we, using this Bayesian network, we have also developed uh, a decision support system for Traspo Scotland uh, for managing uh, the, the bridges uh, under emergency conditions, so weather warning. So currently, Traspo Scotland and I think Network ALS, a similar approach, have uh, flood level markers that are placed, for example, in correspondence of uh, the water level for a uh, 200. Uh, year return period flood, and uh, that they cross the bridge when the water level reaches uh, that, uh, that marker. Uh, however, this marker uh, is defined only in, uh, considering uh, uh, this 200-year return period flood and doesn't account really for uh, the actual scour that is uh, occurring at the base uh, of, of the bridge. And uh, so what we propose is a sort of adaptive marker <laughs> that provides uh, in real time the, the, the water level uh, to consider uh, taking into account the data from available SCOUR sensors. And uh, so here's the, the outcome of the decision support system for this small network of bridges. Instead of having a fixed uh, level of water at which to close uh, the bridge, we have an adaptive level of the, the critical water level that uh, is somehow dependent on the observation of SCOUR uh, in correspondence of the SCOUR probe. And we are also sending the network in order to include the input from uh, inclinometers, total stations, GPS antennas, satellites, uh, accelerometers. This would require basically extending the Bayesian network in order to include uh, the relationship between the SCOUR and uh, peer rotations or deck deflection. Uh, that uh, obviously requires uh, performing some modeling and trusting these models. So, uh, and then uh, an approach for comparing uh, the effectiveness of these, uh, uh, of these uh, techniques is uh, to look at uh, uh, how much the uncertainty is reduced through this uh, simple synthetic parameter that we defined here. Uh, so to wrap up, quite a long list of references uh, uh, of the works that, uh, uh, that I published since uh, uh, my, my starting, uh, my Mary Curie Fellowship uh, here at Imperial, and an acknowledgement to uh, the various uh, projects that over the year have uh, uh, funders that have supported my research uh, over the year. So thank you very much for your attention. This really inside the said the masonite bridges are not resilient to the problems. That's like the strong oh, okay. <laughs> I have a slide for that. <laughs> there are many bridges that have suffered severe defamation due to mining, so that's going to be carrying loads happily over the year. I think that statement. It's a bit strong. Huh? Yeah. Well, they will fall down, but they can have very resilient surfaces. Yeah. Actually, I didn't show this slide, uh, but it's exactly <laughs> what you're saying. Uh, Mensory ash bridges are indeed uh, robust in some cases. And the problem is to understand uh, in which cases they are robust to, uh, to scour and in which cases they're not. And then there is more work to do. But if you look at Calva Bridge, more than half of the foundation was uh, undermined and the bridge still stood up. Linton Bridge experienced significant uh, deflections, 
and I was able to accommodate to them somehow without collapse. And uh, Rubinello Bridge, okay, if you uh, spans collapse, but not the whole bridge. So there was not a domino effect that one would normally expect. And uh, sim similarly, some one bridge, half of the bridge still stood with the foundation uh, severely undermined. So yes, yes, it is indeed true that there are some bridges that uh, are quite robust, but uh, many other bridges, uh, and uh, I'm not showing the one that collapsed because there are not much to see really. <laughs> And uh, the old bridge is very robust and modest, not quite large, but not huge deformation. Right, so, but yeah, from, from a structural analysis uh, too, basically we know that uh, rigid structures uh, are uh, more sensitive to settlements yeah, than, uh, than simply supported structures. They're not rigid structures. They're, they're, uh, because of uh, the mortar no. joints and all this, yeah, we, we know that they are yeah, indeed quite flexible. But yeah, you see the level of displacements. Uh, that uh, at least uh, come up from a numerical analysis uh, uh, until we reach uh, uh, quite suddenly a uh, critical conditions are very, very low. We're talking about uh, centimeters. And also we, we try to infer the crack widths. So we're talking about very small cracks. And uh, so basically what uh, I feel is needed, maybe we can discuss about this uh, later uh, in the end and then with the panel meeting, uh, is, uh, is really a larger scale testing of a real masonry arch bridge subjected to scour. And, and trying to, to understand uh, what are the level of uh, movement and displacement expected before reaching critical conditions. And uh, this would inform the, uh, the development of monitoring strategies and the, the choice of, uh, of uh, accurate strategies uh, uh, with uh, the, the, the actual resolution that is required uh, and precision that is required for, for detecting these uh, changes of, uh, of deformation and of displacements. Thank you. Networks. Do you need a real scour event in order to train it? And along with that, is it generally beneficial to have that rather than having positional sensors in the missing locations? Right. So the Bayesian network uh, uh, doesn't uh, necessarily require any observation, uh, but the problem of that is that uh, uh, by applying it without introducing any observation, using uh, uh, models that are well known to be conservative and characterized by significant uncertainty, you end up with uh, something like this. Uh, a very dispersed uh, estimate of the scour width. So if you just know the, the water level or we have a rough idea of the flood discharge, you end up with uh, a significant uncertainty in the knowledge of the scour at the base. So it is only introducing observations, uh, for example, from uh, a probe located in other locations so that you are somehow able to reduce this uh, uncertainty. So the more information you add, uh, the, 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 the lower is uh, the, the, the uncertainty in the knowledge of SCOWAR that unmonitor the locations. Okay. 